Hello, my name is Kevin Poorman. I'm a developer advocate here at Salesforce. And today on Recruiting for Good, we're going to be picking up with our process of building an application from idea all the way through getting it ready for security review. And in today's episode, we're going to be working on or talking through the things we need to keep in mind when building a software on the Salesforce platform for packaging, specifically packaging for the app exchange. And uh, I know that there are some things you got to keep in mind, and I know that we should start keeping them in mind at the very beginning, but I'm really at a loss as to what those things are. So what I did is I reached out to a couple of fellows on the team I used to work out, and I said, who are the ISV experts in this sort of thing? And they came back and they said, well, uh, there's this guy, Rodrigo Rebicas. Let's hope I pronounced that correctly. It sounds cooler when he says it. Uh, and he is, he's an expert in this stuff. So I reached out to him and he's joining me today. Rodrigo, you want to say something about yourself? Yeah, thanks, Kevin. So hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Rodrigo Rebocas. I'm a principal SV technical evangelist here at Salesforce. And uh, basically my role is to help ISV partners uh, to build their apps correctly on the technical side in our platform. So nice. Thanks for having me here. Yeah, thank you very much for joining us. So. Let's start off with a really overarching question. For those who are not familiar with it, what does it mean to build software on the Salesforce platform for the App Exchange? For what? How do we how do we do that? What does the, the process look like? Yeah. So basically, um, the first main difference um, for from a developer standpoint when you're building uh, for the App Exchange is that you're going to create uh, what we call a managed package. So for those of you, of you that are uh, familiar with uh, packaging, you may have created already an unmanaged package um, and um, an unlocked package, right? So a managed package is another variation of packaging that we have on our platform that allows uh, companies to build applications that can fully coexist, coexist with other apps that are installed on Salesforce orgs, as well as with our um, native platform. So what is different or special about managed packages as opposed to the unlocked packages that I may be used to? So managed packages, um, I guess the main difference um, it starts with uh, each managed package has a namespace prefix that basically is a signature, right, for your company that that metadata containing your package belongs um, to your package so other components uh, in the platform or in that Salesforce org uh, can have the same name, but they're not the same thing from a compiler a technical standpoint. Um, another important difference is that uh, managed packages provide um, developers uh, code obfuscation so, and uh, IP protection. So for Apex uh, code, for example, whenever you add Apex classes to your managed packages, and um, a, a customer installs your application, right, your managed package in their course orgs, they won't be able to see your Apex code. So in this sense, we're uh, helping you guys protect your intellectual property as well. Okay, so let's just make sure I understand these things. Uh, so there, each, each package has a namespace, and that namespace identifies who owns that metadata. So for instance, if my package and your package uh, both have a name field on a given object because mine is prefixed with my namespace and yours is prefixed with your namespace we don't have a collision in those name fields is that right exactly okay. yes great and we also do the code obfuscation how, do, how does that work what does it look like in the end yeah so um, from a customer standpoint, let's say an admin uh, tries to open an Apex class that belongs to a managed package, uh, they, they will not be able to see the code. We graciously um, present a message uh, mentioning that this code is part of a managed package. <laughs> I love and graciously. They cannot see the like, No code for you. <laughs> but we're like, sorry, this isn't a managed package. You can't see it. <laughs> Okay, that's that's awesome. Right. Uh, so the the code obfuscation. What else does a managed package do or have attached to it? What makes a managed package special? Yeah, so one of the coolest things about managed packages is that allows uh, ISP companies to basically support their apps 
um, from a central org, right? Whenever you become a, a Salesforce partner, you have a central org that you manage your ISV business and, and, ISV and managed packages allows you to see and support your, your customers from this centralized org. So for example, um, you can remotely log into that org um, just like Salesforce support does, right? Whenever you guys um, um, grant uh, sales support access, right? Remote support access. So one big thing is uh, being able to remotely log in to your customer orgs to debug your code. That's cool. You can also uh, start um, ISV debugger. So you can also use uh, our debuggers to um, look through code uh, that lives on a customer sandbox, for example, which is something pretty, pretty cool as well. So you can see the customer's code? Do I understand that right? You can see only your code. Only yeah, your code. only the code that belongs to your managed package. Okay. okay. Yeah. And if I remember correctly, managed packages have to be uh, security reviewed, right? Or is it just managed packages listed on the app exchange? They all need to be security review um, before they, um, they are distributed to customers. Yes. It needs to pass security review. No, I remember when I was doing stuff with the ISV team, that, oh, like five years ago, um, the, the security review was like the big hairy deal. Like everyone was scared of getting through security review. Uh, but before we get to that sort of elephant in the room, you talked about the namespaces and like, it does, how do we, how do we pick a good namespace? Is this, do I just call it my company name or... Do I call it my product name? Because I don't, I don't think I can change my namespace once I've created it, can I? Right. No. Yeah. It's it's not possible to change after uh, customers have installed or you have installed um, your app for testing, for example. So it's really important to pick a namespace, a namespace that makes sense, I guess, for your app, because you can have multiple apps and they would have different namespaces. Okay. So I would say a combination between your your um, company name and your app. Um, and um, it's whenever you're registering your namespace, when you're creating a package, um, Salesforce will let you know if that namespace is already taken. So you can kind of go through that exercise until you come up with a good option. So for our, our exercise here, we're building recruiting for good, which we've, uh, it's a it's a twist or take on uh, on making the recruiting and hiring process um, as equal and accessible and diverse and inclusive as possible. And so with that in mind, uh, in our, our name of recruiting for good, we could choose like potential, potential namespaces, uh, include things like we could do RFG. Is there a limit to, to the length of it? Uh, you can go, um, I can't recall the, the number of characters, but you can make it um, at least um, 30 or 50 characters long, I believe. Part of me now wants to name it supercalifragilisticexpialidocious, just because that'd be funny, but uh, it'd be a pain to type all the time. So the namespace, we can, we can see if RFG is available. Uh, we could do recruiting, recruiting for good. Um, yeah. Okay. So I guess we don't need to pick one of those right now. Um, how do we, in our Apex code, do we have to reference our own namespace or does it matter? Or but how does, how does using a namespace and having a managed package affect what we write in Apex code? So that's a great question. So yeah, that's one of the things that developer need to uh, do whenever they're developing for the app exchange is uh, whenever you um, are calling uh, an Apex class, right, uh, from, let's say, a helper Apex class from another Apex class, from a, a parent class, uh, you need to reference so your namespace before the Apex class name. So in, in your examples below, if you're calling um, a, a class that lives on the RFG namespace, you would have to reference as RFG dot then the class name and the method name and arguments. Uh, so it could look like RFG underscore underscore some class dot some method. Yeah, there are two um, 
so this uh, underscore underscore, uh, I believe, is the the approach for Visual Force and for LWC and Aura. Okay. For Apex, uh, it's a dot instead of the underscore okay. underscore. My bad. Now, do we also have to do the same thing for for, for the fields? Like, if I've got custom object, custom, I can type object dot. Who do I need to preface that with a if I'm like in a DML or a query? Yes, if it, if you added that field as part of your um, of your managed package, you would put uh, the RFG dot cust, cust, the object name and then the field name. Yes, RFG dot custom object underscore C dot field name or queries. Okay. Right. That doesn't seem painful. Are there gotcha? No, it's not. And yeah, so um, it's not. Uh, one of the nice things uh, that um, develop that Salesforce DX brought to uh, ISV developers is that uh, you may be thinking, so I need to hard code all these references to my Apex, right? Um, but how, how does it work if I need to push my code to a brand new org, right, for testing or development? Um, I mean, and that org does not, I mean, it's not a packaging org, so it doesn't have the namespace, right? So, uh, Salesforce DX, so before Salesforce DX, uh, a lot of ISV developers had to use um, scripts to add and remove the namespace um, from the, for example, to store on a cold uh, repo, right, as GitHub. Uh, a lot of the partners would remove the namespace references, then store the metadata there, and then uh, add the namespace references just when they're packaging that metadata, those enhancements to their apps. So Salesforce DX now um, allows developers to create what we call namespace orgs. So when on your Salesforce DX project file, you can basically specify your package namespace, and all your developers' scratch orgs will be created with that uh, namespace already uh, defined. So, so you can basically over. store your, yeah. I just started over here. Uh, excuse me, I just switched over to Visual Studio Code. And in there, I see this namespace field in the SFDX project. Is this what you're referring to? Yes, exactly. So I can you add your package space like that. And let's say I've been given that name, that namespace, and just save it, and then I'm done. Yeah. So after you do that, um, whenever you create a scratch org uh, using the Salesforce DX project and your your dev hub, right, which also has the namespace register, all your scratch orgs will be created with um, that namespace RFG already added in the background. So you can just basically push your code, do your enhancements. So basically you can store your, your code with these namespace references on your code repo, which makes it really easy, right? One more reason to switch to DX if you're not using it. The command line is amazing. Okay, uh, so we've got some namespaces that people are using and how to reference them in Apex code and in queries. Uh, how do we like, I'm just sort of thinking through the life cycle here. I've released version one of my app and it's been great. I passed through security view. We'll get to security view later. Um, but what happens is uh, I turn around and I, I want to update my package. I want to create a new version. Uh, how do we handle version? Yeah, so um, the Salesforce uh, CLI. So there are two, two uh, generations of packaging that um, are available in the platform. So there's uh, the new generation, which is what we recommend developers to use, is called uh, 2GP or second generation packaging. That is uh, basically allows uh, developers to, um, to uh, do a lot of interesting things, such as uh, virtually using the Salesforce CLI. Uh, let's say you create an enhancement. Uh, so you can basically use a CLI command to create a new package version. And um, after your package has passed security review, you can basically uh, share that new version with your customers uh, so they can install it on a sandbox and, and experiment with that new version. Or you can also use um, the very really interesting in the platform for ISV that is called push upgrades. 
then it can basically uh, choose the customers that you want to push the new version and automatically push those new versions uh, without your customer admins being involved in the new version solution. So is this, is this like you say without them being involved, I'm envisioning push upgrades looking something like, you know, the Windows. Hey, a new version of Windows is here. Please upgrade now. Uh, is it like that or does it just magically appear? It, it just magically appears, uh, but the cool thing is that because of um, the new uh, in-app guidance, right? You, you can, like a lot of partners are adding uh, those uh, prompts whenever they push new versions to let their users know that there is a new version. And these are the new features available on the new version, so. Oh, I love that. I love that. So you get to work one day, new version, there's just an in-app guidance, a little window saying, hey, I've upgraded recruiting for good to version two, and now we have the ability to actually hire people. Um, so that, that looks right. I love that. Okay. So the second generation packaging seems like the way to go. And in general, uh, so I'm one of those people who, you know, something, a new version comes out. I'm like the first person to upgrade. So when I hear about second generation packaging in my head, I'm going, well, that must mean there's a first generation packaging, but why would I want to use first generation packaging when I could use the latest and greatest? So tell us about first generation packaging. Why would I ever want to use that? Yeah, so uh, first generation package, uh, of course, as the name says, was, I mean, our, uh, as Salesforce started, right, with managed packages, uh, that basically does not use um, the, the Salesforce CLI, right? You can use Sales, Salesforce DX uh, with it, but you know, all enhancements will need to be pushed to a centralized packaging org uh, before you can create a new package version. Um, and, and that's not the case as we, as we discussed with second generation packaging, uh, you may want to check. I mean, uh, we, we have brought into almost parity in terms of metadata coverage for the two, two, um, generation of packagings, but there are still some, uh, metadata types that are only available to be packaged using first generation package. So I would highly recommend developers to check, uh, that list, which is available in our, um, Salesforce um, developer uh, documentation. Is there a link? To uh, but as I said, yeah, we can definitely add a link here to the to okay. the quick document. So, okay, uh, so I'm gonna, we're going to put a link here to how to check that. Is that the metadata coverage report? Yeah, yeah, the metadata can... coverage report. I'm gonna metadata coverage report. You may all be familiar with this. This is one of the. I'm going to pull it up here on a on a web browser as soon as I find one that I can use and uh, come on there we go and what I'm going to do here is I'm just going to open this I'm going to do the Salesforce metadata coverage report this is a super I bookmark this usually um, but this is this is an amazing thing for you to have familiar you'll look here and you can see that these are the metadata types over here on the left It'll tell you whether or not you can deploy them or track them using the metadata API or the source tracking API. And then it'll tell you whether or not it can be part of an unlock package, a manage package, or a classic package. And I'm assuming classic package is 1GP? Exactly, yes. Yeah. And manage package is 2GP. <laughs> yeah. So as we look at this, we can see that you know uh, account action settings are available in source tracking, but they're not packageable. Okay. And as we scroll through this, we could find uh, Apex class. Apex class is packageable in. So if we just say manage packaging, is that 2GP? Yes. Second generation manage yeah. packaging. If we hover over the little I, we get the second generation. Same as uh, classic packaging, we can see that this is the first generation packaging. So this metadata coverage report, super useful to have um, bookmarked. I highly encourage you all to do that. And, and every time you come up with something you're like, oh, can I package this? You can check here. Do you, can you think of anything off the top of your head that you can do with first generation you can't do with second generation? Uh, it's, I mean, the list has been decreasing a lot. So yeah. I maybe you can try prompts, but uh, I can't prompt. recall if, yeah. Oh, there you go. There's it looks, example. yeah. So prompt, what is prompt? 
what is that metadata type? Yeah, it's for all the, the in-app guidance prompts. Oh, the in-app guidance yeah. prompts. Okay. So you can do that in an unlock package and you can do it in a classic package, but not in a managed package. So that's something to keep in mind. Whenever we touch a metadata type, we should verify that it's available for second generation packaging. And I'm going to say we're going to do that with recruiting for good because having done uh, packaging development with first generation packaging, I don't want to mess with that. I want to use second generation packaging. Uh, and not just because it's the latest and greatest, but because it's so much easier to do things from that command line interface. And we'll get to that as we start building the project. Um, so thanks for drawing your attention to that. Let me uh, go back to the metadata coverage report. Oh. Okay. And I'm going to copy that link right here. Just going to, before I forget. Okay. Um, so is it safe to say that metadata in the first generation packaging is always packageable? Is there anything you can do in second generation you can't do in first generation metadata wise? I can't think of anything else. I mean, on any metadata type that would only be available in 2GP. Um, but yeah, I mean, as you said, um, there are a lot of other benefits of 2GP that you guys might want to want to check out. Uh, the ability to to do uh, parallel enhancements. Um, the ability to there's a uh, we have a pilot program where um, in the future. 2GP also, the idea is that it would allow uh, bundling of um, different apps. So let's say you create different managed packages. And if your customer wants to install all those packages at once, they would be able to do that with second generation package bundling. So that's a pretty interesting feature as well that uh, so, is still on pilot. So I have recruiting for good and then I've got like recruiting for good expanded edition and they can install both as one. Yeah, exactly. Clicking in one um, one place to install both. That's the idea. Or using the CLI to install both at once. Out of curiosity, does that handle dependencies? Yeah. So there's uh, that's, that feature is still in pilot, but that's um, that's the idea. Yeah, that we handle all dependencies. That's exciting. That's that's right there. Is super exciting because then what I could do is I can fire up a scratch org definition, and I can pull my scratch org definition in VS Code. I could set it up so that I have certain packages that it install automatically, and I could just put in my top level package and it would install all the dependencies. That's super exciting to me. Ooh, I love that. Yeah. Okay. Uh, back to, back to our quip doc here. Um, okay. So we've got, we've got our metadata coverage report. We talked about different types of packaging, but we, we were talking about how do we handle versioning? So if let's just assume we're going to do uh, second generation packaging. Um, so, we're going to assume 2GP. Uh, how do we handle that version? Yeah, so after you create your package, um, you would run that command to create your, a package version. And that is actually, uh, if you guys have installed any apps from the App Exchange um, and you have seen a link for an installation link, uh, you see an ID uh, that actually that points to a package version. So all uh, package installation um, URLs, I guess, um, actually point to a package version, which starts with 0.4t. Um, that's the that's how it works. So basically, whenever you create enhancements of your app, after it passes security review, you would create uh, a new package version, right, for that enhancement, and then um, you would test the enhancement uh, on your ISV test orgs, right? First on your uh, scratch orgs, uh, you can do some smoke tests as a developer. You would share with your, uh, you would install on, a, on an enterprise edition or a professional edition or a limited edition test org so your QA team can test um, that enhancement. And, um, and then finally, you would sh either share that uh, installation link with your, of the, for that enhancement for that package version uh, with your customers to install or you would um, basically update your app exchange listing uh, so that whenever new customers click on get it now in the app exchange, they would download that new enhancement version uh, that you just created. And we could also push it, right? Yeah, and also use uh, ISV push upgrade, yeah. So the question is, how do we go about like telling the CLI or Salesforce that we have a new enhancement ready? So 
if we're doing second generation, we're doing source tracking. So we've got it in Git, and we're gonna create a new branch that says this is a uh, you know new version uh, or a new enhancement. We're gonna add awesome feature, and awesome feature is done. How do we go about getting that into our creating a package version with awesome feature in it? Yeah, so in 2GP, we simply run a command, um, which has the, the uh, arguments, I believe it's the um, double score package version. And then the CLI actually creates that uh, package version ID with the, the new metadata right on your Git branch or on your local machine. And actually, if you notice on your um, project, uh, when you're developing managed packages, second generation package on your um, project file, a new package version would uh, basically be added here automatically by the CLI. So you will be able to see all your versions here on your uh, on this JSON file. Yeah, I'm going to open up a different project here because we're not writing code today and recruiting for good, but I had that one open. What I'm going to do is open um, I'm going to open up Apex Recipes because we do do a package there, a managed package, or not an, a managed package, an unmanaged package, and you can see what that looks like. Um, all the versions of it here, we don't have a namespace, so it's not a managed package, but we do list a package name, Apex Recipes, and then down here in our aliases, it lists every version of the package that we've released. So that's pretty cool. And yeah. That just yeah. Yeah, another cool thing that happens uh, whenever we upload a new package version is that on that central ISVR that I mentioned where you man ISVs manage their business and see all their customers' installations, uh, you also have um, a not called package and package version. So uh, you would see new records for that new package version that uh, you just uploaded using the CLI as well inside that central org. So you can, again, use push upgrades from that org to push that package version to, to your customers. And you can also see from inside that org uh, which customers have each version installed of your app. Makes sense. Now, we create a package version using this uh, JSON, or this uh, SFDX command. And I'm going to copy paste that here, if it'll let me, without thing about having a cold is you think you can type and then you have a cold and you're like what what am i doing <laughs> all right so I'll do that here and so just to walk through this what this is saying is we're going to create a, a package version um and it's a we're going to give it a, a package of apex recipes that's defined in our um in our uh project file in this project file so apex recipes matches and then we're going to say dash x dash w20 dash f and we're going to pass it the scratch org definition to go create that now i don't remember off the top of my head what the dash x and dash w do but i do remember this one is the, the name of the package um all right so that's how we would generate a new package version with apex with um with 2gp and then once we've done that we're good to go right we've we've created our our uh our package, we can start passing it around. I'm going to use, I'm going to copy this. Um, if it'll let me. Come on, quit. There we go. I'm going to put this through up here. There we go. All right. Uh, so we got versioning down. Um, let's say I release a package version and, uh, you know, oh no. Oh no. Package has a bad, bad bug. How do I prevent users from installing that version ever again? Okay, yeah, so um, you can basically um, use that centralized org to um, basically deprecate a version. So um, you would create a new version right with the bug fix. And um, and you have two options here. So if, for example, what I would recommend is that um, a partner would then um, modify their app exchange listing to point to the new version that has the bug fix, right? So new users cannot install that. 
and they will um, you know, either use push upgrades or reach out to their uh, customer admins with that new enhancement installation link so they can install, uh, update, upgrade a new uh, version that has a bug fix. And then we just deprecate the one that has the bug so no one can install it, right? Right, yeah. Okay. okay. So a deprecated version can't be installed. Um, so even if somebody gets the, the link to it or the ID, they can't install it. I like that. Um, when we talk about being an ISV and we talk about writing software as an ISV for the Salesforce platform, uh, there are two sort of sales models for, for that. And the one that we sort of, I think most people think of immediately is I write some software, I sell it to you, you install it in your org. And, and that's sort of the, the main one. But there's also this sort of like little like side way of doing it where uh, I sell you an org. And if I sell you the org, there are some additional restrictions on that as an OEM org or an OEM partnership. What are those additional restrictions? Yeah, so the main restrictions for OEM apps um, is that um, apps don't have access to, to the CRM uh, standard objects, right? So some of the CRM standard objects, uh, such as leads, opportunities, uh, cases, and uh, campaigns, for example. So uh, the ISV OEM app um, would need to, I mean, usually ISV OEM apps, they, they actually, the use cases do not compete with CRM. So they, they have custom options for their own use cases and they, they, they can still use, for example, some standard objects that are really important, such as accounts, uh, activities, uh, users, um, which drives uh, Experience Cloud, for example, and then um, use that in conjunction with their own custom objects, right, to, for their data model. Uh, let me make sure I understood that. So they don't have access to the standard objects, but they can use account. How does that work? Yeah, it's just a subset of the standard objects oh. that OEM don't have access to. So just to uh, the leads, accounts, opportunities, cases, campaigns, for example. You can use? You cannot use these, yeah, as an OEM. Uh, you said leads, campaigns. Partner. What was that list? Uh, opportunities, cases. Um, I was thinking about our use case of recruiting for good. I don't think we're going to be an OEM app. So that's good to keep in mind, but I don't think that applies to us. Uh, so let's get to the elephant in the room, the security review. Can you give us uh, an overview of how the security review works and, and why we do it, etc.? Sure, no problem. So yeah, so um, trust is the, is the number one value at Salesforce. So. Uh, the security review uh, is basically a process where um, our team uh, goes through your um, your um, code, right? Uh, your ISV partner code, and scans that code and tests that code to make sure there are no vulnerabilities, right? To so expose uh, your in our customers' data, right? So and intellectual property. So our sec our security review process. Um, looks for things like uh, cross-site scripting vulnerabilities, um, stored uh, SSS, and, and um, for example, data sharing, right? So there are some important things that ISV developers need to incorporate into their code to make sure that they don't expose their apps to these types of vulnerabilities. You said it looks for cross-site scripting, and then you said stored SSS. What is that? Yeah, extort uh, SSS. Yeah, CSS. Extort CSS. X CSS. Yeah. Okay. Um, and cross site scripting, for those of you who are, are like, what is cross site scripting? Um, do you have a, a succinct way of explaining that one, or shall I take a stab at it? Yeah, no, you can go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> uh, cross site scripting is a vulnerability where uh, your website can actually accidentally, generally accidentally, uh, run code from a third party website and that can create all right. sorts of nasty issues. Um, so you said there's some things we have to keep in mind when writing ISV code so that we are secure. It seems like this would just be basic like stuff that we would normally do. 
uh, to keep our application secure to be good developers. Um, but I get the feeling that's not necessarily taken as a given. So what are some things that we specifically should keep in mind uh, when doing when writing code for the security review? Yeah, so uh, there is a whole list uh, on the in the partner community when you become a, uh, an ISV partner. I'll just mention the, the most common uh, list of vulnerabilities here, I guess. Uh, so what we see a lot is that um, developers that are, are not used to developing for the app exchange uh, write a lot of code without, uh, you know, CRUD and FLS check. So um, we, we actually came up with a, a nice addition to Sockle which uh, you can simply, developers can simply add um, the, the three words, I mean, with security underscore enforced to the end of their SQL queries. And that um, will make sure that the platform only returns, uh, you know, the data for the objects and fields that the user has access to, the user who is viewing your application, right? Your uh, LWC, your Visual Force page and so on. So that's one of one of the gotchas. <laughs> I would say uh, another one that's pretty common is uh, the use of the with sharing uh, keyword when declaring a class, right? So um, so the class respects uh, sharing, and um, and also like on global classes and uh, and on, on Apex controllers. Uh, another thing that um, that we see a lot is, uh, for example, with uh, Aura in particular, uh, a lot of JavaScript developers uh, try to modify the DOM. So um, by using um, uh, some, some commands, right? So maybe some JavaScript APIs to modify the DOM. And you guys may be familiar with the Locker service, which is our uh, JavaScript security layer that uh, prevents right, any, secure, any vulnerability for JavaScript. So, um, I mean, whenever you're developing for the App Exchange, uh, our security review team uh, will will go through all these uh, possible vulnerabilities in code and and let you guys know if there are any problems. Right? There are some things that developers can do proactively before submitting their their package, their app for security review. So, um, Salesforce, whenever you become a Salesforce partner. Um, we allow you to use our codes, uh, code scanners. So there is a, there are two code scanners that you guys can run against your 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 app, right? On a, on a test org or your developer orgs that will return these vulnerabilities if there are any of these vulnerabilities ahead of time. So you can basically prep your code before submitting for a security review. So one scanner runs scans your code inside a Salesforce org. And if you have uh, integrations with um, other API, or external APIs, um, the other, the, there's another scanner that would also um, scan the external API for vulnerabilities as well. Okay. Um, scans external APIs. Okay, that's that's pretty cool. Uh, this first one is check marks, right? Yes. I, I think I spoke. Is it? check marks, something like that. Okay, so if I'm hearing you right, then what I'm hearing is if we follow coding best practices, um, I'm putting a quarter in the buzzword box, uh, but if we follow coding best practices and we check our code ahead of time, security review shouldn't be all that big of a deal, right? Yeah, it should. Um, if you follow the, the checklist, uh, so there's a checklist for, for ISV developers submitting for a security review. Uh, so if you follow that checklist and if you use these scanners ahead of time, uh, you shouldn't have any problems. Yeah. All right. I'm going to take this opportunity to do a shameless plug. Uh, so I'm going to go over here and I'm going to do github.com and it's going to be. Uh, can the user so uh, this is a library I wrote that abstracts and gives you uh, there's two libraries here one is can the user to checks user permissions for, for access to fields and data and then this one is called safely and safely wraps all DML 
in uh, a, in a uh, let's go down to safely here. Safely examples will give you a very nice way of saying uh, I only want to see the fields and data regardless of what I'm doing, DML or queries that I have access to and user permissions to. So if you use something like safely and hint, we're going to use safely in this project, uh, then you don't have to worry about uh, this this first one where you're dealing with the CRUD and FLS checks. Um, oh, I guess I should unindent these because they're not related to CRUD and FLX, FLS checks. Okay, there we go. Um, okay, so CRUD and FLS checks, I'm going to put in here or you can use safely. Uh, and then developers should write with sharing when declaring a class. Uh, again, this is sort of best practice, right? Is there a legitimate use for without sharing in an ISV app? Yeah, an example would be, which is a very cool feature of managed packages. So um, one of the cool things you can do uh, when when your app is being installed, your managed package is being installed inside an org, is run what we call uh, an ins a post install scripts. So basically run an Apex script uh, after your package is installed, right? Every time your package is installed on a customer org. So you could do things like you know, populate uh, custom settings and things like that out of a JSON file, populate data out of a JSON, or um, make a call out to, to an API to, to prep the app for use, right? Um, so that class is a good example um, of a class that would run on, on system mode, right? Where you would not use with sharing. So it needs to be without sharing, okay. Um, you also like in mentioned passing something about global classes. Are there any gotchas with global classes? And for those of you who aren't familiar with a global class, a global class exposes your, excuse me, the global modifier exposes your class to, to the outside world, outside of your namespace. So while that namespace protects you and, and keeps all of your code internal, if you mark it as global, then all bets are off, right? Can the users actually see the, the contents of a global class? I believe they can't. No, all Apex says is obfuscated. Yeah. But they can call it and they can, they can right. see it's in They can still call it. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so uh, global classes. Um, I, I find that I almost never use them in practice, but specifically with an ISV app, um, I'm wondering, like, there was some, I seem to remember there was some kind of gotcha, like, once you once you had a global class, you can never get rid of it. Um, right. Is that is that true? Yeah, and, and there are legitimate reasons, right, to to write global classes. Uh, but you, you, I mean, developers should be careful and only declare it because of this um, this aspect, right? They cannot be the leader uh, from or or turn back into a public class or a private class, for example, after you declared it as global. So that's uh, a gotcha that we identified uh, for ISV developers. Gotcha. Let me write this down. Deprecated, deleted, or converted to public, private. All right, that makes sense. Um, do you find that, so as somebody who deals with ISVs on a daily basis, do you see them using a lot of Aura, or are they doing Lightning Web Components? Yeah, we see, I mean, more and more Lightning Web components because of all the, the performance benefits, right? And the, and the, the easiest, uh, easiness to, to uh, you know, uh, get data from, from Salesforce org and, and, and manipulate data and so on, yeah. right? All the wire services benefits. But we still have some partners that um, have um, some legacy R components, but we're seeing more and more they're, they're turning their our components into LWCs, right? Starting from the child components to the parent components. So that's gotcha. that's the trend that we have seen. Yeah, All right. partners. Um, and then, okay, so I have this theory and uh, my theory goes something like this. Your average Salesforce developer still predominantly writes Apex and Visual Force. Um, it's moving towards LWC, towards Aura, but there's so much visual force out there that needs to be maintained. 
that your average developer is still focusing a lot on visual force and apex so what are some like i don't want us to focus entirely on things that are just aura or lwc focused what are some gotchas or things we need to watch out for in the security review process with visual force pages yeah, so uh, with Visual Force Pages, uh, a lot of developers use uh, JavaScript, right, mm -hmm. uh, to get a Visual Force markup. Mm -hmm. So there is a, a, a whole list. It's basically um, like a whole list of uh, JavaScript um, requirements for uh, security requirements for Visual Force okay. that you guys can find in our our security documentation. Those are usually the 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 main uh, challenges. Also. Um, running, uh, I mean, calling, uh, running things on page action, uh, for example, fetching data on page action, things like that. So there's a, I, I recall there's a, there are some secure recommendations for that as well you for Visual Force developers. On page action, you mean like when the page loads? Yeah, exactly. Uh -huh. On init for. On yeah. page load. Um, okay, and. We're going to find the link to the security documentation there and um, put that there. Now, we're in a bit of a unique situation where for recruiting for good, uh, we don't ever intend to sell it. And so it's still going to give you prep for security review, but we're, we may not actually push it through security review. The source code is going to be open source. We want to make sure that this is something people can go and see how we did this, that we follow these best practices. Um, but we may never actually pull the trigger on going through security review. Um, it seems to me like this is, uh, we've, we've covered the highlights here. Is there anything we've missed that we should really keep in mind or consider when developing for an ISV audience? Um, I guess uh, I would say um, try to, I mean, try to develop your um, your applications using second generation package because you would be prepping your your app for the future, right? And try to modular modularize your apps, um, so creating different modules on different managed packages um, is also a good strategy for to prep your app for the future. Um, and yeah, avoid using uh, old technology for custom UIs. Uh, so try to focus using. LWC, as, as you were saying, and um, yeah, no, I guess I guess we covered the rest. Uh, really focusing on uh, secure coding for security, right? So coding your app uh, to make sure it's secure for 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 uh, for users, and that uh, no ver no vulnerabilities will be found, uh, so you can breeze to security review. All right, now. I want to back up here and you said something about modularizing your app and using different packages. Can you say more about that? What do you mean? Yeah. So, uh, some partners, um, um, have like, uh, some complex applications that, for example, they try to bring to our platform for their, uh, Salesforce version of their platform. And sometimes it makes more sense to, um, create different packages for different modules of that app, as opposed to creating like all the modules inside the same package, that makes sense. So by modularizing and creating different packages, right, um, you will be uh, opening your app for uh, interesting things. For example, when bundling is available, which is currently on Safe Harbor, right, um, Pilot, um, then it would it would be it would make it easier for your users to to install uh, those bundles. Okay. And also, they would have the option, right, to just install a part of your app as opposed to other app, other parts of your app that don't really make sense to them. Unless it's a dependency thing. Right. Okay. Well, cool. Well, Rodrigo, we, uh, we have a few minutes left. And uh, because this is a pre-recorded version, I'm sorry about that, the holidays um, always come this time of year. And so we pre-recorded this episode. I want to thank you, Rodrigo, for joining us. And um, because we normally leave this amount of time left for interactions with guests who are, who are talking with us uh, through the chat, we're going to be a little short today, and I apologize about that. But we've covered the, what we need to, to cover, and um, I think this has been great. Look for us to actually start building this Recruiting for Good app here in the new year. We've almost wrapped up all of our sort of conceptual thought through 
planning ones and we'll start building the app here in in the new year so again rodrigo thank you for joining us and uh those of you who are tuning in at home we will see you in the new year bye-bye thanks Kevin. take care